Hi guys, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. It's great to have you here. I'm Henrik. This is Red Ice Radio. If you are listening to the radio version of this show, just know that there's a video version available for you as well. First hour always on redice.tv and both hours on redicemembers.com. Today we have Simon Roche from Sudlanders with us today, who is currently in uh, in LA on a speaking tour with a few of his colleagues. Thank you for uh, coming on, Simon. It's uh, great to have you here. Thank you very much, Henrik. Excellent. It's going to be good, I think. A lot of things to run through today, a lot of details, a lot of developments actually in South Africa. But tell us first, Simon, how did you end up in, in LA and what are you guys doing there right now? Well, we're on a speaking tour of the United States. We've come all the way from uh, Orlando, Florida, uh, speaking along the way, meeting with like-minded people. And the purpose of the speaking tour is to raise funds for the purchase of civilian, non-combatant, vital necessities. So vital necessities for civilian non-combatants in the event of a severe crisis in South Africa, an armed conflict. Um, we believe or we can see, anybody can see that the trajectory of crisis in South Africa is continuing. Uh, it shows no signs of decreasing. In fact, it's heated up a lot in recent months. And we believe that we must that we have a moral obligation to our people to urgently endeavor to finalize our preparations as a civil defense organization for the for safeguarding the welfare of civilian non-combatants particularly women and children in the event of a crisis in South Africa now we'll get into details here shortly of what it is that's happened why things have ramped up what what, what you know what this means but tell us just a little bit first uh, su sued or sued landers. What what is that for those who don't know? Well, I'll, I'll pronounce it our way, if if you don't mind. It's Sait Saitlander. Saitlander, which means South Lands, right? South Lander. Yeah, you could even simplify it to to Southerners, if if yeah. you like. But yours is a more literal translation. But there's nothing wrong with saying Southerners. Um, the Saitlanders is a civil defense organization constituted under Protocols 1 and 2, additional to the Geneva Conventions. The protocols make specific provision for the safeguarding of the welfare of civilian non-combatants in armed conflicts. Protocols 1 and 2, additional to the Geneva Conventions. And we are constituted under that international law, which is adopted by South Africa, um, so we are fully, fully, fully legal and lawful as a civil defense organization. We're not seditionist. We don't undermine our state. We're not insurrectionist. We don't uh, agitate uh, the kind of stuff that you're looking at right now. We, we leave that to other crazy people to do. We're not militant and we're not militaristic. We are purely a civil defense organization constituted under the aegis of international law. Are people accusing you of being aggressors as opposed to being uh, on a defensive position, if you will? Um, n not that much, because we've secured ourselves through, you know, obeying the law so well for so long that people have tried to catch us out. And we've had false charges laid against us. Our leader was was set up and the, the judge threw the case out of out of court. It was an absolute nonsense thing, but the South African police set him up um, on a, uh, a weapons possession charge, for example. And uh, we know that the South African state is desperate to catch us out. But by and large, we've managed to keep our noses clean um, just by obeying the law. And uh, so people aren't really in a position to criticize us, although we have found one or two observers in the United States kind of leaping to some wild conclusions. Um, but it's, uh, there's, there's no basis. So just for those who are not up to speed in terms of what's going on in South Africa, let's assume that they consume regular mainstream media, they're tuning into this yeah. for the first time. Just give us the most yeah. basic rundown that you possibly can of what the situation <coughs> is like right now in South Africa for the white European descendants that are living there. Very briefly, South Africa held universal elections for the first time on the 27th of April, 1994. So we've had 23 years of democracy. During that period, the crime rate has skyrocketed in South Africa. 
we are sometimes referred to as the rape capital of the world. Uh, our murder rate is astonishingly high, and particularly the, the rape and murder of white people on farms, that is to say farmers, is beyond most people's comprehension. Uh, to, to illustrate the point for you, South Africa is a violent society, so it's to be expected that South African policemen, uh, you know, that this, that they're attacked often and they die often. The rate of murder of South African policemen is amongst the very highest in the whole world. But it is just more than twice as dangerous to be a South African farmer. Now, that to most people is incredible. It's a statistic that you almost don't expect people to believe because it's not believable. But it's a fact that um, the, the, the murder of white farmers in South Africa is double the rate of murder of policemen, which indicates for you how severe things are on a crime level. Coupled with that, the state has, has deteriorated drastically. We have a government and a state apparatus that is saturated with incompetence and uh, unwillingness, if you like, with the result that the country is crumbling, as you can see from the, the, the images on, uh, that you're showing on the screen from our website, and there are many more like them, of different incidents in different places. Um, and it's now reached the point where there is a crescendo of calls from, uh, from the populist demagogues in South Africa for the, the uh, expropriation without compensation of all white property. For example, the leader of the party that you can see, the people wearing red in, in what you have on your screen, mm -hmm. those people belong to a party called the Economic Freedom Fighters. <clears throat> They're a party with millions and millions of support. And the leader of that party said on the 7th of November last year in the town of Newcastle in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, I am not calling for the slaughter of all whites yet. Two days later, his right-hand man said that, um, I, uh, forgive me if, if I don't get the quote verbatim, but it was along the lines of, if we do not get all white land expropriated without compensation before the 3rd of August, are we going to have to resort, resort to slaughtering all the whites? Now, I think I did get it almost verbatim um, as, as I was speaking. And, um, the, 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 well, let me put it to you this way. The... I have to choose my words carefully, Henrik, but a very, very, very senior traditional leader, that is to say black traditional leader of a kingdom in South Africa said to me, in your culture, those statements could mean anything. In my culture, they mean only one thing. They mean, I want you to slaughter all of the whites. We are going to have a violent revolution get ready, and in the starting blocks. Um, I think that answers your question, Henry. Yeah. It's an it's a extremely dire situation, and it's been an uphill battle to get the international community to understand the, uh, the seriousness of the situation. And obviously that's coupled with the background of South Africa, with the intense propaganda war that has been fought after, you know, post-apartheid, uh, basically. Um, if you just could describe for us a little bit how it ha what the conditions has been like after apartheid leading up to today, has things just slowly escalated, or or has it just kind of been on a on a on a steady pace, so to speak, of of you know of really bad uh, scenarios for the white farmers specifically? Yes, it, it has been a steady pace. If you look at the statistics, you can see that shortly after the nineteen ninety four elections, once people realized that the government would condone or tolerate um, murder and rape in a way that hadn't previously been tolerated, they, they found their, their self-confidence, you know, and they, they set about it with, with greater eagerness. And you can see in the statistics a steady upward trend to levels that would not be accepted anywhere else in the world. 
Dr. Gregory Stanton of Genocide Watch in Washington, D.C., who, by the way, is a noted liberal who was an anti-apartheid activist, in other words, not a natural ally of conservatives such as ourselves, Dr. Gregory Stanton visited South Africa in 2012, and following that visit, there are two things worth mentioning. Firstly, he placed white South Africans, all white South Africans, in the final phase of his measuring tool before all-out genocide. And even we were astonished to hear that. And he explained how the system works, and he said, I genuinely believe that you are being set up for a genocide. Now, Dr. Gregory Stanton of, of Genocide Watch in Washington, D.C., is the man who predicted the Rwanda genocide a year before it happened, but a year in advance. In other words, he wasn't saying 12 months prior that it's going to happen tomorrow. He was saying this thing is going to happen in about a year's time, and it did. So he's an acknowledged expert, and he's saying that we are on the cusp of, of a genocide. Furthermore, he said in an interview shortly after uh, his visit, the worst thing about what I've seen is that it's clear to me that this is being orchestrated. In other words, that the murder of, of white people by black people, which has now reached, and I'm not speaking of the farms, I'm speaking generally, <coughs> of the whites in the population of about 4.6 to 4.8 million, nobody's sure because our Department of Statistics is not mathematically competent. Um, and, and it's well known that they sort of mess it up every time. But between 4.6, 4.8 million white people um, is it just past the 74,000 mark. I spoke to an American scholar two weeks ago who said that he's positive that the number is closer to 120,000. And I said to him, well, you know, I don't want to say that in interviews because it's not consistent with most of the research. And he gave me his, his research, and I have to say that it was fairly persuasive. He's not an idiot, and he's done a very good job of attempting to ascertain the, the number of murders. Now, nobody knows the correct number because some years ago, the Minister of Safety and Security, that is to say police, justice, jails, the correctional system, uh, penitentiaries, and so on, um, stood up in Parliament following a barrage of criticism of how the government is, is handling crime, yes, the, the people who were complaining were necessarily white, white newspapers and or predominantly white newspapers and political observers and, and so on. He said, if people don't like the crime in South Africa, they should leave. Now, this is the attitude of the government. Shortly after that, the government adopted a policy of not releasing statistics by race. In other words, there's no way to know how many people have been murdered. We know for certain that it's a minimum of 74,000, that is to say white people murdered by, by black people. And as I say, there's an American scholar who presented certainly to me a very persuasive argument that it's closer to 125,000. Wow. It makes you think. Jeez. It's amazing. Yep. So when when you guys are speaking about this and with consideration to, let's say, the international media, uh, is, is there any willing voices? Or, I, mean, I mean, I know that you can reach outlets like ours who are actually willing to listen to you guys, have you present your story, talk to us, what's going on. Uh, we don't have any reason to doubt you or not to believe what you're saying. But beyond alternative outlets such as ours and, and other similar, is anyone willing to listen? How, they, how do they treat this? <laughs> They're not interested at all. I don't want to, you know, sort of go digress into the realm of um, conspiracy theory, but we are firmly convinced that it's a deliberate thing, that internationalist capitalists are delighted by the, the unrest in South Africa. And it, you know, one of our newspaper groups is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the fourth largest media group in the world. It's an unknown fact that from a little old country like South Africa, we have such massive, massive influence on the world media. Um, but that newspaper group, which is so internationalist, capitalist um, and anti 
nationalists would never co copy us and w with the result that you can read about lawn bowls tournaments on Monday morning in its newspapers, but you can't read anything about St. Lunders, for example, or, and other bad news, uh, in their minds bad news, even though St. Lunders is the world's largest non-state, non-state owned, the world's largest civil defense organization. But we get no coverage, nothing, although we're a global phenomenon in terms of numbers. So they're absolutely thrilled with what's happening, in our opinion, and in our opinion, the lack of coverage is 100% deliberate and we get none, absolutely zero. The only coverage that we've had in the past, let me say, three years, I think it's fairly safe to say that the only coverage we've had is one interview with a, a major international magazine, which will come out later this year, and I'd rather not mention the name. Uh, I don't want to anticipate what they're doing. Uh, with a French newspaper in December and then the coverage we've received in the USA. Otherwise, nil, absolutely nil. So it's absolutely amazing that they're looking the other way on this. And, and obviously this is, I think it's done for various reasons. I think one level it's virtue signaling. I, again, I think for because of the intense uh, pressure of information and propaganda surrounding apartheid they feel that this is such a hot potato probably that they can't you know they don't want to touch it they, they can't to a certain extent uh, I, I really don't know but as you say I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't dismiss this aspect that they might actually do it um, because yeah. somehow they they see that it's I don't know pay payback or something I mean I don't know what, what do you think what do you think is driving that why would they do this I think that in the liberal environment th there is a mentality of payback certainly uh, I think that in the media environment, they're going to look like massive fools if the if they, you know, bear in mind, Henrik, that they rammed the propaganda of the new South African Rainbow Nation down the throats of the whole world for decades, and they're going to look like fools if they turn out to be 100% wrong. And I'm not suggesting that apartheid was a good thing. I wouldn't have liked to have been a second-class citizen under apartheid. And I'm not suggesting for a second that the world should begin to view apartheid for good and for worse as, as a, a wonderful thing. That's not the angle here. However, after everything that they told you, me, and everybody else about Nelson Mandela, what a dear, sweet man, such a lovely smile, um, and the African National Congress and so on, for them to publicized, for example, Nelson Mandela, after his death, two of his close friends and senior leaders uh, 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 confessed that Nelson Mandela had remained a member of the South African Communist Party Central Committee clandestinely up until his death. Now, nobody knew that, you know, when he was going to church and kind of, you know, pretending to be one of those guys and I believe in God and love your neighbor and all of this kind of stuff. Actually, he believed something completely different. And so that kind of expose didn't, didn't see the light of day. And I think that the international media is terrified of being made to look like idiots by a situation in South Africa where we have a president who's had seven wives, seven, not the four or five reported. And if you're interested, I can explain to you how it is seven. Um, we have a situation in which we have 3.2 million taxpayers paying uh, social grants in effect for 16.3 million people. So the, the economy is, is going to pieces. Unemployment has reached almost 40%. Again, it's a statistic that we don't expect people to believe because it's unbelievable, but we'll, we'll tell you what is the truth and people can verify it for themselves and see that generally the statistics that we quote are conservative. If we err on the side of caution and conservatism all the time, it helps us to not to get into trouble. But they'll see even more severe statistics than that. And the world media doesn't want to acknowledge that it's fast heading towards being a bastard case because it's going to make them look like twits. Yeah, the, the Rainbow Nation idea and then they've been also... I mean, they're also trying to sell this at the same time to other countries, right? I mean, Europe is now experiencing an importation of a lot of North, Northern Africans and Sub-Saharan Africans, yeah. Middle Easterners, etc. And 
if they would start to back off, if you will, in South Africa, it would just kind of set the precedent for us also in a way of saying, oh, okay, well, maybe then not that's not a good idea. So tell uh, the audience about what it is specifically that you guys are trying to then to raise funds for. You're talking about vital necessities. What, what are these? What are you, How are you guys looking to prepare? What what can you guys do? I mean, tell us about the, the situation that you're in right now and how you're seeking to kind of remedy that with the help of, uh, of Europeans living elsewhere around the world. We have a comprehensive national emergency plan, which is very highly detailed and very highly regarded worldwide. We periodically get requests from people all over the world. Um, You may be interested that we've recently had a request from a group in Sweden um, who asked us specifically to give them input so that they could model a plan that they have Oh, on, on our plan, once they read it, they, they saw that it was quite a good plan. And that massive plan covers a scenario in which the provisions of the protocols additional to the Geneva Convention are met, which is to say, or let's say the criteria, which is to say that I and my buddies can't run out tomorrow and occupy a little hill in a desert and say, don't come near us, you know, we, we're... Um, we're a civil defense group and, and we're occupying this hill for ourselves. It doesn't work like that. Certain criteria must be met in order for us to be able to say, right, now we seek the safeguards of international law as provided in the protocols additional to the Geneva Conventions. And, of course, there has to be a certain severity of conflict. There has to be a certain amount of, um, of uh, jeopardy. Uh, it has to be an armed conflict, etc., etc., etc. If those criteria are fulfilled in a civil war or in an international conflict, which is to say that a conflict in which other countries support one or another entity in South Africa, we would endeavor to withdraw from that conflict and declare ourselves non-combatants. In fact, the phrase that's used in in international law is a non-party. We would declare ourselves a non-party and we would say we want to have none, nothing to do with this nonsense. We would then ensure that we go to a certain place and we pr- safeguard the welfare of civilian non-combatants. Our plan is intended to cater for about 800,000 people. We don't believe that more than that number of people would make it to us in the event of an all-out combat in South Africa along racial lines, such as the leader of the EFF is proposing or implying or or indeed instructing, as that traditional leader said to me, face-to-face, um, in person. Um, we have about 6,000 daily active members And we have about 12,000 ancillary members. And what I mean by that is that we're not like a stamp collecting club. Once a week, you can go along and see what the other guys got stamps or whatever, or a football club, go and watch a match. Uh, Once you've joined the St. Londers and you've met people and you understand the plan and you've made your preparations and you've got what your means permit you to have uh, in terms of preparations, there's not much reason to go to... 75 meetings where you discuss the same topic. So we have a fairly high turnover of members who remain loyal to us over decades, but who are not active members. So we have about 6,000 active members and about 12,000 ancillary loyal members. That's about 18,000 people. And if we include their families, then we come to well over 70,000 people, perhaps over 100,000. That core membership's responsibility is to ensure that other people threatened by conflict who are refugees are able to enter the safe zone that we create. Our plan entails, and the fundraising, as you originally asked, entails the, uh, the, the purchase of vital necessities, particularly dieseline, Water purification facilities, long, long, uh, long life food, and seed 
for, for future crops. And medicine and communications and logistical items. <clears throat> Those are the core elements of, of our plan or the core, the core material uh, elements of our plan. So this is how dire the situation is then. So, so explain a bit more to us more directly what it is that's happening. You have, I think there's multiple things at the same time. You have Malema, of course, from the economic freedom fighters that are pushing the rhetoric. Uh, they're trying to radicalize a lot of people to turn against white people. How, I mean, how, is he, is he credible? I mean, is he just a, a fringe outsider at this point or is he gaining more and more popularity from a political point of view? He's by no means a fringe outsider. Let me put it to you this way. On, if I'm not mistaken, the 6th or 7th, the 6th or 7th of January 2015, our president said at a banquet dinner, all of South Africa's problems uh, stem from the arrival of whites in South Africa at the Cape of Good Hope on the 6th of April, 1652. And again, this traditional leader, a senior traditional leader, he's, a, he's the boss of, a, of, a, of an entire nation of people, said to me, in our culture, when you say things like that, you are declaring an enemy, a threat to you. In our culture, what that president said is, if you are miserable, the way to improve your circumstances is not to have this these people here. Whatever problems you have wouldn't exist if we didn't have these people. He said, that is how we hear these things. And he explained to me, it's because um, black African languages have a smaller vocabulary than English, which is a very logical answer. There's nothing wrong with it. So he said, there's less subtlety and nuance there's less interchangeability of synonyms. Therefore, when people say things like that, it has a very specific meaning. And he said the other thing is that allegory, metaphor, in, in, um, in black African languages <coughs> is more particular and less versatile. So if you speak in a certain way, you have a specific intention. And he said when the president says something like that, there are millions and millions and millions of people who are hearing that the president has declared an enemy of the people. There are other examples. The uh, brother of our former president, whose name is Moilets Mbeki, uh, has said recently that we are standing on the cusp of a civil war. Uh, there's a, another person, I'm, it just escaped my mind for a second, a very senior black leader, who said recently, a few months ago, that we are headed towards a civil war. His words, we are on our way to a civil war. So it's not just uh, Julius Malema, although as you can see by the photographs that you have on stage, people might write him off as peripheral. He's far from it. He has the support of many millions of people, including people who don't vote for him, people who are very loyal to their party, believe that he, is correct. And if he called for a revolution tomorrow, we would expect to see far more people than just the, the five or whatever number of million people who support him in participating. So is this something that could be, does it just feel like it could be trick triggered at any moment? I mean, what, what made it, what made you or and the group, you guys kind of reach this point uh, has it been this bad for just a long a long time uh and 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 you guys just said all right we gotta we gotta reach out we gotta reach other people from other parts of the world because we're not getting the help internally in our own country right so it, obviously it served multiple purpose you guys traveling around speaking about this is is raising awareness of something which is probably the most covered up uh, atrocity i'd say in in modern times frankly with with, with the, the brutality and the murders and the rapes and the and the open racism towards white people in, in south africa but what triggered you guys to to finally take this step well it's it's uh, my, I'm, I'm just choosing my answer carefully henrik you know i don't, I don't want to sound like a, a uh, i'm proselytizing or evangelizing but 
part of this scenario involves a series of prophecies that was given by um, a man a hundred years ago in which he described, um, he, he was a very well-known seer, a seer of visions and, and what have you, and with an impeccable record. And he, he told people that there would be a terrible, terrible struggle that would begin in South Africa after democracy, as it were. And in fact, it was so much so that he lost all of his credibility because nobody believed at that time that there would ever be black rule in Africa. Bear in mind, 100 years ago, in, let's say, 1900, um, when he gave many prophecies, around about 1900, uh, up until his death in 1926, um, the world was just two generations or three generations away from the Berlin Conference where Africa had been carved up by the European powers. Mm -hmm. And the, the world was still two generations away from, from the first black African countries having any independence. So it was a, a fantasy, a fiction, nonsense. But this guy said there will be black rule in South Africa. And the first black, the first black ruler on the throne of South Africa would be deemed a saint by the world. And that when he dies, world leaders would come from all over the world to pay homage at his graveside. Now, in that series of prophecies, uh, a friend of his said, look, tell us when this terrible crisis is going to happen, because he described a crisis beyond imagination. I, I can hardly tell you how severe this thing was that he described. He said, well, one of the, the signs that, that, that he gave was that in the world, there would be a flood, uh, sorry, not a flood, he used the word wave, a wave of black and brown skinned migrants into Europe. He said, when that wave of, mi of migrants occurs into Europe, when you see that wave, then you will know that there's about to be a conservative backlash or reaction in the north, that is to say, in the northern hemisphere. He said, once you see that conservative backlash, once the conservatives rediscover their voice, then you will know that the time is fast approaching for, for a global crisis and a South African crisis. He said, then you will be a very short time away. He said that a, a, a white man would take over the leadership of the USA from a black man. I'm not giving you the allegorical terms, but for since forever, for a hundred years, however long you like, it has always been understood because of the very particular allegory that he used, that it could only be referring to the leadership of the USA. So this is not a new thing. It's you can read books going back a long way. Um, he said, when a white man takes over the reins of leadership of the USA from a, a black boy, then you will know that things are hotting up. And he said there will be a man, a very powerful leader, who is not um, in Europe. In other words, he's not separated by South Af from South Africa by land. You know, between South Africa and Europe, there's a, a small pond called the Mediterranean. It's not, um, he used the, the, the the sea, he pointed out that it was a man across the sea who has hair like a wig. And he said that man will be a sign to, to everybody. So I don't want to get into Trump, prophecy. Trump's fro, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and, and how often is it ever going to happen that, that, that a white male takes, you know, how many black presidents will there be? So we believe, without trying to persuade other people to share our beliefs, there's one country in the world who that you can imagine people speaking openly about slaughtering an entire population group. You couldn't get away with it anywhere else in the world. But because of this mantra of idealism, this, um, this kind of narrative of this liberal narrative that's been forced down the whole world's throats about the new South African rainbow nation and Uncle Nelson Mandela and the Benevolent African National Congress and it was never a terrorism organization. They were freedom fighters. You know, ironically, you have a situation in which they've got a license to say these perverse things. Um, and and that's, that's the long and the short of it, really, Henry, no. is that uh, there's, there's more than enough cause for concern. Yes, it is. So 
are you still then you guys are still figuring that the, the most difficult aspect of this well of course beyond beyond the violence obviously and, and what you're experiencing but reaching out to mm. the world is that uh, people out there are just they're just not comprehending they're just not understanding what's going on and 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 they can't accept that this is happening right it's, it's, it's just a denial and and if if you bring this to their attention they just deny it. I mean, I've I've read comments from from white South Africans themselves, probably liberals or lefties or whatever, and they just mm. like they laugh at this. And they, you you guys are crazy, yeah. right? I mean, what do you how what do you to say to these people if they if they're not experiencing or willing to look at this firsthand? What do we do, right? Yeah, I think um, Henrik. My opinion is that we have to. Um, to some extent, focus our efforts in the place where we're going to get the most reward. And I don't think that, I think that some people are beyond any persuasion. We will never, ever, ever convince some people that one and one equals two. You know, it looks like 11. We want it to be 11. The world, if only we loved each other more and all people are inherently good, all of this kind of uh, stuff, you know, they refuse to see the truth. They would much rather believe that it's prudent for Europe to take in 100 million refugees than to believe the very obvious logic that if you have a, 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 a cake dough mix and you add an almond, you know, nut, and then two, and then six, and then a thousand, and then 10,000, that it's not going to taste like almonds. Right. You know, it's, 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 it, it, those people will never believe anything. They'll never understand anything. And they'll never approach this matter with intelligence. And I, I don't say this with hatred. Please don't get me wrong. But they will always approach it influenced by intellectualism rather than intelligence. In other words, they have been so heavily influenced by the liberal conditioning and they are reaping the seeds sown so deeply by communism in Western society. As we know, as Nikita Khrushchev told the Minister of Agriculture what do you call it, Secretary of Agriculture, I don't know, in 1965, I believe, in the USA, he said, even if communism goes, we have sown seeds of liberalism so deep in Western society that it's going to be um, bearing fruit for decades and decades after we have gone. The point being that these guys want to be intellectual. They want to be persuaded by the BBC and CNN and ABC and NBC and CBS th that they should think in a certain way. It, it makes them feel good. We have to focus on intelligent people. People, and I've, again, I say this without uh, loading the remark, without judgment, uh, without patronizing anybody like yourself, who in spite of the fact that you've, however old you are, you've had 30, 35, whatever number of years, of brainwashing in every single publication that you've ever come across. You've managed to maintain an, uh, uh, an intelligence whereby you can work out things for yourself. And you don't have to read Marie Claire magazine or, or Time magazine in order to have a thought. Um, we have to focus on people like that because we are wasting our time if we try to persuade people who are just just never going to believe us. Uh, we, we can't win this situation unless we draw those closest to us, those people who have the most in common with us, nearer to us, and we stand firm. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. So we're going to take a break in a little bit, a bit here to, you know, take a pause and then continue with more in the second segment. There's much more to discuss and, and just getting into the details of everything that's happening and uh, where where you guys are going uh, from from here and so forth, but uh, a couple of things I want to ask you about before we take a break. Obviously, you know we're going to alert people to the website where they can go, how they can help you guys out. Maybe if they can even catch you somewhere in terms of the speaking tour. But what was the name of the the? It was interesting. Then there's kind of a I guess a spiritual component to this, a backdrop to this. What what was the the that gentleman's name who who had had this prophecy? You 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 might struggle to find anything in English, but. Um his name is, uh, the best Google search term is not to use his, his first name, but to use the, the expression Sia. So I'll spell it for you. S-I-E-N-E-R. Okay. Okay, and then his surname is, is in two parts. They're two separate words. 
The first one is V-A-N, fun, V-A-N, or van, if you like. And then Rensburg, R-E-N-S-B-U-R-G. All right. Van Rensburg. Tina van Rensburg. Yeah. All right. Interesting. That's that's very interesting. So um, people can check that out if they want to try to find more and if they can find any more uh, details about that. So tell us, tell us then uh, the the action plan. You guys have the website set up, of course, Sudlanders.org, Sudlanders.org. Um, how can people help you help you out? What what where can they go? What can they do? Uh, what do you recommend people to do that are concerned and want to help you guys out? Henrik, if anybody would like us to uh, talk at to their group or to their church, anywhere in the USA, they only have to ask. If it's not feasible, we'll say no. But we have spoken to groups of, literally, we, we drove a thousand kilometers. So that's something like 700 miles to speak to two people in Phoenix. And we would gladly do the same again. We changed our route from the I-40 to the I-10 to go down to Phoenix, Arizona, to speak to two people, knowing that it was two people. So people in the USA should not be shy to ask if they would like us to come to them. If we've already been in that region and we can't go again, then we won't be able to do it. But we will go for anybody. We are desperately trying to spread a word. <clears throat> and it's a fundraising tour, but people needn't pay fees up front. If they can only give us $5 or $10, or nothing at all. That's okay. Um, so to answer your question, we'd like to speak to people. We'd pe like people to invite us to go and speak to them. We'll be speaking to about 50 people this coming weekend in Oklahoma City. Uh, we'll be speaking the following weekend in Columbus, Ohio, to about uh, 30 people. And in uh, Cadillac, Michigan, we'll be speaking to about 100 people. Um, the the following weekend, we'll be speaking to uh, 30 to 40, uh, I beg your pardon, sorry, about 50 select invited guests in the Pacific Northwest, not far from Seattle, but that's, that's invitation only. Um, we have uh, an, an open diary for the future. We will remain in the USA for as long as it takes for us to get the word out. And for as long as it takes for for us to raise the funds that are required to look after mommies and babies in the event of a civil war. Uh, th yes, that, that's it, uh, Henry. Very good. So have you noticed uh, that the when I mean, there's a large population in America, clearly, but there's also yeah, there's a large population in, in Europe overall. Is there a difference in reception uh, if you compare America as opposed to Europe? No, I wouldn't say so. We've. We've had very similar receptions from France, Italy, Sweden, Germany. Uh, oh, Britain. We've had a very, very terrific response from, from a few people in, um, in Britain. Um, yeah, I would say that the response has been similar. There seems to be a consistent sort of discourse uh, when we engage with them. They're all very concerned about the irrationality of the world that they're living in. And that refers to a few things. And they're all saying, look, you as a conservative organization representing a people which is clearly embattled and clearly standing on this, the cusp of a potential crisis, uh, we want to help you for this reason and in this way. Now, I would say that the responses have been pretty similar. All right, very good. Well, we have much more to discuss, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so do stay with us in the second segment. We're going to talk more. Uh, Sudlanders.org is a website. Please check it out. Go there. You can donate through the site as well, I believe. Right in the footer, there is a, a donation button, and that will help you guys out. Are you? Have you set a goal for what you would like to achieve, or, or, or uh, is, there, is there any kind of, <laughs> what do you call it, a benchmark or milestone that you'd like to reach with the trip? Yes, it's, it's quite an ambitious goal, and it's not ambitious for the sake of ambition. It's ambitious because it coincides with a particular level and degree of, of uh, preparation within a few hundred thousand dollars. It just so happens it's a lucky coincidence. But around about $10 million will permit us to provide a comprehensive uh, presentation covering various things. It's about $9.98 million that we coincidentally came into. So ideally it's $10 million, but that's very ambitious and we're not hung up on it. We're not... 
making this into some kind of materialistic thing. If we only raise a few thousand dollars, well, so be it. We will stand and fight and die as we have to do for our people against a, a, a crazy barbarianism that is now conspicuous and everybody can see it. And if we don't have money, that's fine. We'll do the best that we can. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it's very difficult to get people to understand, uh, to be honest. It's, it's very, very difficult to, to reach people on this level, which is ex extremely sad, of course. But I think more and more people will get their eyes open. And as you can see, if you're watching the video right now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's a, a Bitcoin link at the bottom uh, of the footer and also a, a PayPal uh, donation button. So if you guys want to help out and, and help them reach uh, you know, the goal that they have set, uh, which is not a lot, considering that they're, uh, you know, uh, have a, a contingency plan for about 800,000 people, which which is a lot of people, obviously. But um, yeah, so do help out, do what you can. Uh, please make sure that these guys can also remain in the U.S. and, and uh, you know, continue their speaking tour and raise awareness about this. So very good. We'll take a short break here, uh, Simon. Stay with us. We'll be right back with, uh, with more. We'll uh, talk to you on the other side. Thanks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the second hour plug that we do. If you enjoy this show, please sign up for a membership with us to catch the second hour. We have over 1,200 radio programs archives going back to 2006. We do several new radio shows each week. On top of that, we also do individual videos. We do a live TV show that you can watch most Saturdays, exclusive for our members. And when you subscribe, you also get access to all Radio 314 shows hosted by Lana, and you can watch all the other video material, films, inside episodes, live coverage, etc. The whole gamut. So help us produce more, cover more, and bring on more people. So support independent alt-right media. Go to redicemembers.com and sign up right now to continue listening or watching the second hour with Seaman Roche from Suit Landers. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be right back after the break. From, uh, from the populist demagogues in South Africa for the, the uh, expropriation without compensation of all white property. For example, the leader of the party that you can see, the people wearing red in, in what you have on your screen, mm -hmm. those people belong to a party called the Economic Freedom Fighters. <clears throat> They're a party with millions and millions of support. And the leader of that party said on the 7th of November last year in the town of Newcastle in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, I am not calling for the slaughter of all whites yet. Two days later, his right-hand man said that, um, I, uh, forgive me if, if I don't get the quote verbatim, but it was along the lines of, if we do not get all white land expropriated without compensation before the 3rd of August, are we going to have to resort, resort to slaughtering all the whites? Now, I think I did get it almost verbatim um, as, as I was speaking. And, um, the, 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 well, let me put it to you this way. The... I have to choose my words carefully, Henrik, but a very, very, very senior traditional leader, that is to say black traditional leader of a kingdom in South Africa said to me, in your culture, those statements could mean anything. In my culture, they mean only one thing. They mean, I want you to slaughter all of the whites. We are going to have a violent revolution get ready and in the starting blocks. Um, I think that answers your question, Henry. Yeah, it's a it's a extremely dire situation and it's been an uphill battle to get the international community to understand the uh, the seriousness of the situation. And obviously that's coupled with the background of South Africa, with the 
intense propaganda war that has been fought after, you know, post uh, apartheid, basically. Um, if you just could describe for us a little bit how it ha what the conditions has been like after apartheid leading up to today, has things just slowly escalated, or or has it just kind of been on a on a on a steady pace, so to speak, of of you know of really bad uh, scenarios for the white farmer specifically? Yes, it, there has been a steady pace. If you look at the statistics, you can see that shortly after the nineteen ninety four elections, once people realized that the government would condone or tolerate um, murder and rape in a way that hadn't previously been tolerated, they, they found their, their self-confidence, you know, and they, they set about it with, with greater eagerness. And you can see in the statistics a steady upward trend to levels that would not be accepted anywhere else in the world. Dr. Gregory Stanton of Genocide Watch in Washington, D.C., who, by the way, is a noted liberal who was an anti-apartheid activist, in other words, not a natural ally of conservatives such as ourselves. Dr. Gregory Stanton visited South Africa and two are not militaristic. We are purely a civil defense organization constituted under the aegis of international law. Are people accusing you of being aggressors as opposed to being uh, on a defensive position, if you will? Um, n not that much, because we've secured ourselves through, you know, obeying the law so well for so long that people have tried to catch us out. And we've had false charges laid against us. Our leader was was set up and the, the judge threw the case out of out of court. It was an absolute nonsense thing, but the South African police set him up um, on a, uh, a weapons possession charge, for example. And uh, we know that the South African state is desperate to catch us out. But by and large, we've managed to keep our noses clean um, just by obeying the law. And uh, so people are really in a position to criticize us, although we have found one or two observers in the United States kind of leaping to some wild conclusions. Um, but it's uh, there's there's no basis. So just for those who are not up to speed in terms of what's going on in South Africa, let's assume that they consume regular mainstream media. They're tuning into this yeah. for the first time. Just give us the most yeah. basic rundown that you possibly can of what the situation <coughs> is like right now in South Africa for the white European descendants that are living there. Very briefly, South Africa held universal elections for the first time on the 27th of April, 1994. So we've had 23 years of democracy. During that period, the crime rate has skyrocketed in South Africa. We are sometimes referred to as the rape capital of the world. Uh, our murder rate is astonishingly high. And particularly the, the rape and murder of white people on farms, that is to say farmers, is beyond most people's comprehension. Uh, to, to illustrate the point for you, South Africa is a violent society, so it's to be expected that South African policemen, uh, you know, that, this, that they're attacked often and they die often. The rate of murder of South African policemen is amongst the very highest in the whole world. But it is just more than twice as dangerous to be a South African farmer now, that to most people is incredible. It's a statistic that you almost don't expect people to believe because it's not believable. But it's a fact that um, the, the, the murder of white farmers in South Africa is double the rate of murder of policemen, which indicates for you how severe things are on a crime level. Coupled with that, the state has, has deteriorated drastically. We have a government and a state apparatus that is saturated with incompetence and uh, unwillingness, if you like, with the result that the country is crumbling, as you can see from the, the, the images on, uh, that you're showing on the screen from our website, and there are many more like them, of different incidents in different places. Um, and it's now reached the point where there is a crescendo, 2012, and following that visit, there are two things worth mentioning. Firstly, he placed 
white South Africans, all white South Africans, in the final phase of his measuring tool, before all out genocide. And even we were astonished to hear that. And he explained how the system works. And he said, I genuinely believe that you are being set up for a genocide. Now, Dr. Gregory Stanton of, of Genocide Watch in Washington, D.C., is the man who predicted the Rwanda genocide a year before it happened, but a year in advance. In other words, he wasn't saying 12 months prior that it's going to happen tomorrow. He was saying this thing is going to happen in about a year's time. And it did. So he's an acknowledged expert. And he's saying that we are on the cusp of, of a genocide. Furthermore, he said in an interview shortly after uh, his visit, the worst thing about what I've seen is that it's clear to me that this is being orchestrated. In other words, that the murder of, of white people by black people, which has now reached, and I'm not speaking of the farms, I'm speaking generally, <coughs> Of the whites in the population of about 4.6 to 4.8 million, nobody's sure because our Department of Statistics is not mathematically competent um, and, and it's well known that they sort of mess it up every time. But between 4.6 to 4.8 million white people um, is it just past the 74,000 mark. I spoke to an American scholar two weeks ago who said that he's positive that the number is closer to 120,000. And I said to him, well, you know, I don't want to say that in interviews because it's not consistent with most of the research. And he gave me his, his research. And I have to say that it was fairly persuasive. He's not an idiot. And he's done a very good job of attempting to ascertain the, the number of murders. Now, nobody knows the correct number because some years ago, the Minister of Safety and Security, that is to say police, justice, jails, the correctional system, uh, penitentiaries and so on, um, stood up in Parliament following a barrage of criticism of how the government is, is handling crime. Yes, the, the people who were complaining were necessarily white, white newspapers and or predominantly white newspapers and political observers and, and so on. He said... If people don't like the crime in South Africa, they should leave. Now, this is the attitude of the government. Shortly after that, the government adopted a policy of not releasing statistics by race. In other words, there's no way to know how many people have been murdered. We know for certain that it's a minimum of 74,000. That is to say, white people murdered by, by black people. And as I say, there's an American scholar who presented certainly to me a very persuasive argument that it's closer to 125,000. Wow. It makes you th Jeez. It's amazing. Yep. So when, when you guys are speaking about this and with consideration to, let's say, the international media, uh, is, is there any willing voices? Or, I, mean, I mean, I know that you can reach outlets like ours who are actually willing to listen to you guys. Have you present your story? Talk to us. What's going on? Uh, we don't have any reason to doubt you or not to believe what you're saying. But beyond alternative outlets such as ours and, and other similar, is anyone willing to listen? How, they, how do they treat this? <laughs> They're not interested at all. I don't want to, you know, sort of go digress into the realm of um, conspiracy theory. But we are firmly convinced that it's a deliberate thing that internationalist capitalists are delighted by the, the unrest in South Africa. And, it, you know, one of our newspaper groups is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the fourth largest media group in the world. It's an unknown fact that from a little old country like South Africa, we have such massive, massive influence on the world media. Um, but that newspaper group, which is so internationalist, capitalist, um, and anti-nationalist would never co copy us and w with the result that you can read about lawn bowls tournaments on Monday morning in its newspapers, but you can't read anything about St. Lunders, for example, or, and other bad news, uh, in their minds bad news, even though St. Lunders is the world's largest non-state, non-state owned, the world's largest civil defense organization. 
but we get no coverage, nothing, although we're a global phenomenon in terms of numbers. So they're absolutely thrilled with what's happening, in our opinion. And in our opinion, the lack of coverage is 100% deliberate and we get none, absolutely zero. The only coverage that we've had in the past, let me say, three years, I think it's fairly safe to say that the only coverage we've had is one interview with a, a major international magazine, which will come out later this year, and I'd rather not mention the name. Uh, I don't want to anticipate what they're doing. Uh, with a French newspaper in December, and then the coverage we've received in the USA. Otherwise, nil, absolutely nil. So it's absolutely amazing that they're looking the other way on this. And, and obviously, this is... I think it's done for various reasons. I think one level it's virtue signaling. I, again, I think for because of the intense uh, pressure of information and propaganda surrounding apartheid, they feel that this is such a hot potato, probably that they can't. You know, they don't want to touch it. They they can't to a certain extent. Uh, I, I really don't know. But as you say, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't dismiss this aspect that they might actually do it um, because yeah. somehow they they see that it's I don't know pay payback or something. I mean I don't know. What, what do you think? What do you think is driving that? Why would they do this? I think that in the liberal environment there is a mentality of payback, certainly. Uh, I think that in the media environment, they're going to look like massive fools if the if they you know bear in mind Henrik that they ran the propaganda of the new South African Rainbow Nation down the throats of the whole world for decades, and they're going to look like fools if they turn out to be 100% wrong. And I'm not suggesting that apartheid. Hi guys, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. It's great to have you here. I'm Henrik. This is Red Ice Radio. If you are listening to the radio version of this show, just know that there's a video version available for you as well. First hour always on redice.tv and both hours on redicemembers.com. Today we have Simon Roche from Sudlanders with us today, who is currently in uh, in LA on a speaking tour with a few of his colleagues. Thank you for uh, coming on, Simon. It's uh, great to have you here. Thank you very much, Henrik. Excellent. It's going to be good, I think. A lot of things to run through today, a lot of details, a lot of developments actually in South Africa. But tell us first, Simon, how did you end up in, in LA and what are you guys doing there right now? Well, we're on a speaking tour of the United States. We've come all the way from uh, Orlando, Florida, uh, speaking along the way, meeting with like-minded people. And the purpose of the speaking tour is to raise funds for the purchase of civilian, non-combatant, vital necessities. So vital necessities for civilian non-combatants in the event of a severe crisis in South Africa, an armed conflict. Um, we believe or we can see, anybody can see that the trajectory of crisis in South Africa is continuing. Uh, it shows no signs of decreasing. In fact, it's heated up a lot in recent months. And we believe that we must that we have a moral obligation to our people to urgently endeavor to finalize our preparations as a civil defense organization for the for safeguarding the welfare of civilian non-combatants, particularly women and children, in the event of a crisis in South Africa. Now we'll get into details here shortly of what it is that's happened, why things have ramped up, what what, what you know what this means. But tell us just a little bit first, uh, sued or sued landers. What what is that for those who don't know? Well, I'll, I'll pronounce it our way if if you don't mind. It's Southlander. Sight, Southlander, which means Southlands, right? Southlander. Yeah, you could even simplify it to to Southerners if if yeah. you like. But yours is a more literal translation. But there's nothing wrong with saying Southerners. Um, the Saitlanders is a civil defense organization constituted under protocols one and two, additional to the Geneva Conventions. The protocols make specific provision for the safeguarding of the welfare of civilian non-combatants in armed conflicts. 
protocols one and two additional to the Geneva Conventions. And we are constituted under that international law, which is adopted by South Africa. Um, so we are fully, fully, fully legal and lawful as a civil defense organization. We're not seditionist. We don't undermine our state. We're not insurrectionist. We don't uh, agitate uh, the kind of stuff that you're looking at right now. We, we leave that to other crazy people to do. We're not militant and we're